Hello, my name is Spencer, and in my podcast called The Dictionary, I literally read from the dictionary, but add in my personal comments and stupid jokes to make it more interesting. Episodes are family-friendly, short, and air every single day on basically every podcast platform. Come join me on this journey filled with edutainment. Hello and welcome to How Did This Not Get Made? This is the podcast all about the movies you never saw, the scripts that were never filmed, and the ideas that never even made it to the page. My name is David Spencer. My name is Daniel Kaka. My name is Charlie Marlowe. And my name is David Gansel. Now we're going to transition here into the movie. And a lot of the information that I got was actually from an interview with David Carson for Polygon, which was conducted by Jack Yarwood. When we did our Tin Toy Christmas episode, we went through a lot of the history of Pixar and how it started at Lucasfilm and later separated in 1986. It seemed like George Lucas was creating multiple divisions in his production company, all of which seemed to push for better technology in film and entertainment. In 1975, Lucas founded the visual effects company ILM, also known as Industrial Light and Magic, which was a byproduct of the visual effects Lucas wanted for his first Star Wars film. When ILM began, they primarily worked on making practical visual effects for movies, but slowly they started integrating digital effects when they worked on the films such as The Abyss, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, and Jurassic Park. For ILM, they began increasingly worried that digital visual effects would take over as the main form of special effects, and with computers becoming cheaper and more powerful, ILM was fearful that the other visual effects companies would be hired instead of them for much cheaper. Fast forward to 1995 and the premiere of a little indie film called Toy Story, <laughs> a film made entirely out of digital visual effects. ILM saw the success Pixar got from this film, and they knew that they needed to make their own digitally animated film. Why not? They had yeah. the technology to do it. And that film was called Attack of the Clones. <laughs> <laughs> ILM's then president put together a team of eight people to come up with an idea for a CG animated movie. The idea was to create this first film internally, then collaborate with other studios to make their CG animated movies. As for the first movie that they were going to create, it was going to be Frankenstein and the Wolfman. <laughs> the film was in collaboration with Universal Studios in hopes to revive their monster property, in which they still have not done it. <laughs> Keep yes. on hoping, Universal. <laughs> Dark Universe is going to happen any day now. One day. <laughs> My favorite thing about the Dark Universe, this is local for us Californians here. If you ride Revenge of the Mummy at Universal Studios Hollywood, specifically the Hollywood version, for years when you left the ride, the exit hallway would have wallpaper from Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. <laughs> then when the Dark Universe Tom Cruise Mummy was coming out, they changed it to put up wallpaper promoting the Tom Cruise Dark Universe Mummy. And then when that movie flopped as hard as it did, they just took the wallpaper down. And now that's just an undecorated hallway you oh, leave. Oh, that's <laughs> why. <laughs> because just promoting nothing is better than affiliating themselves with Dark Universe. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> so this film was going to have two directors each representing the different studios. From ILM, they got David Carson, who was working as a visual effects art director at the time, and Brent Maddock, who was the writer of Tremors, Short Circuit, and Ghost Dad. He was hired by Universal Studios. <laughs> There's lots of movies that have collaborative directors. It's wild to me to think of two separate studios each saying, well, here's our director and there's your director. And somehow they're going to figure out how to work together and make a movie. We're going to put them in a cage match. <laughs> so the crew was hard at work at creating multiple scripts, concept art, and animatics. Everything was going well until Babe, Pig in the City. At no other time in his short life had the pig wished more that his words could be understood by humans. If only to say, sorry, boss. Sorry, boss. Over at Universal Studios, the head of production was Casey Silver, and he resigned after the box office failure, Babe, 
pig in the city. <laughs> Silver was also the one who hired Maddock to direct Frankenstein and the Wolfman. The new heads at Universal reviewed the production. They removed Maddock from the film, claiming that the film was, quote, too dark. Hmm. What are we trying to make? Some kind of dark universe over here? <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't scrap the project yet, but to replace Maddock, Universal allowed ILM to choose a new director to take over. And so they chose the production's animation supervisor, Tom Bertino. Also to assist was Stephen Summers, who was the writer of The Mummy, who was hired to help develop a new treatment for the film. Soon after Summers was hired, Universal greenlit his sequel, The Mummy, and left ILM on radio silence. <laughs> Carson grew increasingly frustrated with the lack of feedback from Universal, and he left the film to be directed by Bertino in 1999. A few months later, the production was canceled, but ILM was not going to give up on making a CG animated film. You said 1999 we're at? It was 1999 So we're at. ILM is trying to produce their own film when Phantom Menace is coming out. It's three years before Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> They're still being hired by other companies to do stuff. Yeah. There's just like a small team of people that are just like, figure out how to make a movie. Do any of you know how to make a movie? <laughs> That's so interesting to me. During the 4th of July weekend in 1999, David Carson took a trip with his 15-year-old son to Clear Lake, which is in Northern California. There, he and his son talked about their love for adventure video games, and it also helps that his dad worked for ILM and technically Lucas Films, so that he would get all the Lucas Arts game at an employee discount. <laughs> so whenever Carson would get any of these games, he would play them with his kids. Carson asked his son if it would be a good idea if Monkey Island would be a great movie, and with great enthusiasm, his son said yes. A few weeks later, Carson was meeting with ILM's president, Jim Morris, not Jim Morrison, which I <laughs> nearly wrote down. Please, Mr. Mojo Rising was my father. <laughs> Morris was not familiar with the game, but instead of shutting down, he suggested pitching the idea to Amblin Entertainment, more specifically, Steven Spielberg. The first treatment Carson put together was a loose adaptation of The Secret of Monkey Island. Here's just a few of the differences. In the first scene, we follow Guybrush. He's around 20 years old. He enters a seaside market where he meets the local pirate. Guybrush expresses his goal to be a mighty pirate, and the pirate tells him of Melee Island. And there's a supply boat leaving soon, and he should hitch a ride on it. ILM was trying to do a complete CG movie. Correct. Is this still going to be a complete CG, or was yes, this going to be live action? This is going to be a CG movie. Okay, okay. That's interesting as well that it seems like, I mean, it would have been the same thing with the monster films, that that would have been like the first CG animation that was like for a little bit older. Like, I don't know if it was still going to be, you know, PG, something that kids could watch, but it sounds like it's a little less child friendly than Toy Story. Yeah, it probably could have beat DreamWorks and Shrek to the market of the skewing at least teenage CG animated film. Yeah. <laughs> Although they have said the target demographic of Monkey Island is anyone who owns a computer. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of children that played it because they couldn't afford to make games that children couldn't play. Sure, it's not sure. child unfriendly, although there are parts in the games that might be scary for children, and there are some mild swear words in the second game. And alcohol. There's lots of alcohol. There's plenty of alcohol. But it's got pepperoni in it for the kids. <laughs> My French for kids. Going back to the treatment, we follow the ship's journey with Guybrush aboard to Melee Island as the credits flash on the screen. It's dusk when the boat arrives. Guybrush happily waves to the crew, who could care less about him. Guybrush makes his way up the steep, windy trail onto the cliffs as the sun sets. He stands on the cliff, overlooking the island, a scene similar to the game. Guybrush makes his way to Scum Bar. The three trials that Guybrush endures is reduced down to just one. The multiple scraps that Guybrush has with the local pirates is then condensed to one fight with LeChuck's undead skeleton crew. Murray, the talking skull, makes an appearance in this movie, even though he didn't appear until the third Monkey Island game. Oh, people online must have been real mad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Murray is in the final act where he teams up with Herman Toothrot and the wild monkeys to rescue Guybrush from being thrown into a river of lava. 
Carson presented the first treatment to ILM's head of digital feature, Patty Blue. She then hired Corey Rosen and Scott Lieberich to help Carson flesh out the script. The two weren't really writers. They actually both worked at ILM already. Rosen was a CG artist and Lieberich was a art director. Their job was to write a second draft of the treatment to pitch to Spielberg. Carson's treatment did deviate from the original game story, but he did more so just to condense it for the film. That was one of the things you would have to do, just condense things, because, yeah, the first act of the game is a lot of walking around figuring out puzzles. Yeah. From the way you're describing it, the ways he condensed those puzzles into more singular events that still captured the spirit of those puzzles without making the audience sit there and figure it out. Like, yeah. It seems like it would have been the right move. Yeah. Yeah, that would only work if it was the climax to Last Crusade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rosen and Lieberich began to really deviate from the game. In this new version, Guybrush must go to Monkey Island in search of treasure so that he can pay his union fees to become a pirate because all pirates are union workers. <laughs> that is canon to the games. He does have a scum actor skilled card <laughs> on him. And then Guybrush meets Elaine Marley on the docks of Melee Island after he leaves Scum Bar. She is on a mission to find her missing brother, Kit, who was shipwrecked on Monkey Island. Kit Marley! <laughs> Kit Marlowe is the nickname of Christopher Marlowe, the playwright who wrote Tragic Tale of Dr. Faustus and is believed by many conspiracy theorists to be William Shakespeare. Huh. Yep. I did not make that connection. <laughs> oh, what would you know about a Marlowe, Charlie? <laughs> As a Marlowe, I can't avoid it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So she's hesitant at first until the henchmen of LeChuck arrive, attempting to kidnap her. And the two escape and take off on her boat to Monkey Island. They arrive on the island. They find Kit amongst the tribe of monkeys. Elaine is kidnapped by LeChuck and his crew. And Guybrush saves the day by dousing the undead pirates in molten lava. I wouldn't have realized that Monkey Island actually had monkeys. I would have figured it was just a name. <laughs> I believe there is one monkey on the island in the first game. <laughs> but the fourth game on the back of the box boasts it has more monkeys than the rest of the franchise <laughs> combined. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so that treatment that I just read, that was the treatment that was pitched to Steven Spielberg. Hmm. I mean, Spielberg's a great choice because the pirate scenes are the best part of Hook. He actually did play the Monkey Island games like... Whenever LucasArts employees are asked, did George Lucas ever play any of your games? They always respond, no, but Spielberg does. <laughs> Spielberg has the reputation of making movies that are great for kids, but are also exciting and adventures that anybody else can love, which the ideal audience for a Spielberg movie is anybody in front of a screen, just like the ideal audience of a Monkey Island game is anybody with a computer. <laughs> That's true. Since the first Monkey Island game was developed right after they developed a game based on a Spielberg movie, <laughs> it's all tying together. There is also a hook point and click adventure game that kind of copies the formula of Monkey Island games. Oh. So Carson flew to Amblin with Patty Blue to meet with Spielberg. Carson was incredibly relieved when Steven Spielberg stated, I told George years ago that he should make Monkey Island into a film. <laughs> this was going to be an easy film to sell. I love the idea that Spielberg is talking to George Lucas like, you really need to turn that Monkey Island game into a movie. And George Lucas is like, what are you talking about? What's Monkey Island? <laughs> and the funniest part is that Lucasfilm got bought by Disney and they accidentally acquired Monkey Island, which means the rights to Monkey Island have never been owned by someone who has heard of Monkey Island. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, once he greenlit the picture, he then directed them to two other Amblin producers to help figure out the details. Carson was asked who he wanted to cast as the voice actors, which he hadn't considered. He just figured that he was just going to use the same voice actors that they used in the game. Do that! <laughs> which was Dominic Armado as Guybrush and Earl Bowen as LeChuck. Oh. The late, great Earl Bowen, who passed away recently. Played the psychiatrist in the Terminator films. When there were only three Terminator movies, he was the only person other than Schwarzenegger to appear in all three of them. Oh. Hmm. At the risk of turning this into Pod Made You Special, to go into the depths of Christian media, he did voices on Adventures in Odyssey back in the day. Oh, oh. wow. In including basically most of the villains you hear in Adventures in Odyssey were Earl Bowen. Huh. Huh. <laughs> Quick fun fact about Dominic Armado, because there was a five-year 
difference between the first two games and the first voice acted game. He went from being a middle schooler who considered it his favorite game to being a working actor in Los Angeles. And that was his first audition. Wow. Wow. And he was just like, wait, this is literally actually my dream role. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) He only stayed in LA doing voice acting for a few years. Part of it was he had another dream job, which was food critic. And he got to work at his favorite publication. So like he you know, did everything he ever wanted to do. <laughs> it was like, where do you go when your first audition is your dream role and you book it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right after the movie was greenlit, they then hired Steve Purcell, who was actually the background artist of the first two Monkey Island games. And then he betrayed them and went to work at Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, then the story just started derailing even further. And we're going to go through that eventually. But before we do so, I do want to talk about the rumors that the Curse of Monkey Island may have inspired the Pirates of the Caribbean film. Although there is no definitive proof, here's what we do know. Around the time that Monkey Island was on its third draft, ILM producer Kim Bromley began hosting lunchtime interviews with professionals in the film industry. During the lunches, ILM employees would be allowed to ask the professionals questions, and in return, they would be given a tour of the ILM studios. Two of those guests were writing partners Terry Rosio and Ted Elliott, famously known for writing Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, and the sequels that followed. The visit was arranged by Amblin with the hopes that the two would be interested in working on Monkey Island. They showed them artwork and storyboards, but they were not aware that Rossio and Elliot were already hired by Disney to write a draft for Pirates of the Caribbean, a movie based on the ride. Rossio and Elliot declined the offer, most likely knowing that this would be a conflict of interest. Any elements from Monkey Island that can be found in Curse of the Black Pearl can be speculated on, but it doesn't seem like Rossio and Elliot were out to steal their ideas. Yeah. There are way more Monkey Island parallels in Dead Man's Chest. I have another theory on this one. Uh, What's that? Rossio and Elliot obviously wrote a film adaptation of On Stranger Tides that was the fourth film in the Pirates of the Caribbean series with Jack Sparrow just idly standing by uninterested in the plot to the book. (laughs) Rossio and Elliot insist that they didn't even hear of On Stranger Tides until they were working on the third film. But Tim Powers said that Barbosa and the idea of supernatural pirates was clearly just a ripoff of his work. So it's entirely possible that they said they hadn't heard of it until they had officially paid to license it <laughs> to cover their tracks uh. so they didn't get in legal trouble. And if they had read On Stranger Tides, that would explain way more of the parallels than any of these other theories give. So you see, they weren't ripping off Monkey Island. They were just ripping off the things that Monkey Island ripped off. Yeah. yeah. It really seems like it's a situation where if two different stories are inspired by the same source material, there's going to be overlap between those stories. At the beginning of LeChuck's Revenge, there is a brief bit where you have to use a coffin as a rowboat which Jack Sparrow does at the beginning of Dead Man's Chest. And so in Return to Monkey Island, there's like this pirate museum, which is like a parody of game historians that get all the details wrong because they weren't there for it. (laughs) The coffin that Guybrush used is in there. And when you ask the curator about it, he says, oh, a very famous pirate used that to escape a Turkish prison. And Guybrush is like, no, I used that. (laughs) Which... Means he mistakenly attributed the coffin rowboat to Jack Sparrow. So that's the one where it's like, these are the only two times this idea has existed in fiction. That definitely is a little suspicious. Yeah. Before this information came out that Ted and Terry were met with, but not actually at any point working on it. For years, the rumor that was out there was that Ted Elliott had actually written a draft of Monkey Island, Mm. which is apparently not the case, according to these sources. If that were the case, the charitable reading is 
some of the ideas subconsciously seeped their way through into what became Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. That was believed to be the truth that was unchallenged by anyone for like a decade. Yeah. Monkey Island is one of my favorite franchises in the world. And I say this with all love when I say that by design, it is not that original. (laughs) It remixes tropes and iconography in a creative and original way. But... It is a game that is full of references. I understand that if you grew up on Monkey Island and did not encounter the things it was referencing, you'd go from that to looking at Pirates of the Caribbean and just be like, hey, this is all stuff from the game. You would have just missed it by that much. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's like saying that all spy movies now are ripping off Austin Powers. Yeah, exactly, (laughs) exactly. The inclusion of fantasy elements in pirate stuff. I don't know what the history of that is in pirate media because I feel like the little I know about how it exists, at least in movies, is that, you know, if you go back to like even Errol Flynn stuff, like was there ghosts and skeleton crews and stuff. I haven't watched a whole lot of Errol Flynn films, but Tim Powers believes that the idea of undead pirates is his creation. Is from On Stranger Tides. Both Captain Hector Barbosa and Captain LeChuck are based on the animatronic of a skeleton holding the helm of a ship on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Which the funny thing about that skeleton is like, it's not even clear if that's supposed to be a living skeleton or just like a dude propped up there. It was almost certainly supposed to be a person who died at the wheel of their ship and the wind is just blowing their hands as if they were still alive. And the idea that two different people interpreted that as what if it was an undead pirate is where people are like, this is weird. (laughs) I mean, I think when you're a kid writing Pirates of the Caribbean and your imagination is doing so much of the work for you, especially if you write it right after you rode Haunted Mansion right down the block. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Ultimately, this all just became a bunch of stuff Disney owns. Yeah. (laughs) For fans of Monkey Island who did not know the other things that Monkey Island was drawing from, This really was the story of, you know, like the big evil corporate Disney behemoth just ripping off the little guy. You know, the little guy who was just funded by, let me check, George Lucas, the richest man in Hollywood. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The idea that my favorite video game is about an undead pirate capturing a governor and her love interest having to go save her. And my favorite movie is about an undead pirate capturing a governor's daughter. (laughs) (laughs) There was an interview with Tony Stachy where he mentioned a conversation that he had with Rosio and Elliot. He pitched them Monkey Island, and he remembers them saying, look, you love pirate movies, we love pirate movies. No one in Hollywood is going to make a pirate movie. And sure <laughs> enough, a few months later, Disney announced Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. <laughs> you can always trust a dishonest man to be dishonest, I think. <laughs> <laughs> So this wasn't a complete loss for ILM because the studio would help with working on the CGI for Dead Man's Chest when they created the Davy Jones character, in which they won an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects in 2006. Mm. Now, fans of the games, sometimes in a very hostile way, no, there's no toxic fandom in Monkey Island. (laughs) They actually started attacking Horacio and Elliot for stealing the ideas from Monkey Island for Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirate fans hate stealing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) In August 2006, Ted Elliott responded to a question on his website asking if he ever played Monkey Island, in which he replied with a very simple, nope. Now, many of the issues with Monkey Island seem to come from within ILM. Carson brought up that one of the struggles the writing team ran into was developing the main character, Guybrush Threepwood. Quote, While his character made a great avatar for players of the game, it was harder to lock on who he was as the hero of the film. Hmm. From Corey Rosen, quote, In retrospect, there should have been more interaction between ILM and the game developers at LucasArts. They know this world. They love this world. They were deeply steeped in Monkey Island, and we were Hollywood types. We were dicks. We were taking their idea and making a movie of it, and we weren't including them. 
That's stupid. That's not how anything should be done. When you are using source material, you have to access those people. That's dumb that we didn't do that. The closest I've seen in a film protagonist to having Guybrush vibes is Emmett in the Lego movie. Uh, Yeah, that's kind of similar. One of the things about Guybrush as a game protagonist is... While he does have a clearly defined personality, there is also some leeway for the player to kind of choose what facets of his personality they focus on. Mm. When someone insults you, you can choose to, like, give a really sassy comeback or blatantly not realize that something mean was said to you. Mm. There's a moment in the first game where Sheriff Fester Shine Top, you know, lures you into an alley and says bad things can happen to people who go down dark alleys. And one of the options for a response is like threatening him back. And then one of the options is just saying, oh, did you hear something back here too? (laughs) (laughs) One of the fundamental problems with video game movies is that often the protagonist does not have a personality because they're meant to be an avatar of the player to express their own agency. Mm -hmm. This is a game where the protagonist has much more of a defined personality than a lot of games. So if they were already encountering this hurdle with this adaptation, imagine how hard it was for Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then came the second meeting with Steven Spielberg. This was not going to plan when one of the first things Spielberg mentioned that the main characters should not be human. According to Carson, he wanted to focus on the monkeys on Monkey Island. (laughs) Sounds like he didn't really play Uh the game. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. I think he played the game once and then kind of remembered the vibe. (laughs) (laughs) Carson was appalled and all the other executives just nodded in agreement. According to David Carson, he met with island president Jim Morris, not to be confused with Jim Morrison, (laughs) because he didn't know what to do. He didn't have a script about monkeys on an island. They would have to do a page one rewrite, and they would have nothing to do with the game. And the fans would be disappointed, and Spielberg doesn't seem interested in financing the movie that they were currently working on. Morris told Carson to continue with the story they're working on now. And so they did. Do you think the massive Looney Tunes fan Steven Spielberg just thought cartoons were about funny animals always? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So more artwork was developed and Rosen finished the screenplay. The team just had to wait for the money to make the movie. And that never came. And soon the team were assigned to work on other projects. And Monkey Island was just left behind indefinitely. Now, I do have a summary synopsis of what this movie would have looked like or what the plot would have been. But before we go into this plot, we are going to take another break for ads. So we're back. Hopefully you plundered some gold. (laughs) So let's talk about the plot summary of The Curse of Monkey Island. We open on a pirate stealing a jewel, Mission Impossible style. The jewel is called the Eye of the Monkey from the head of the idolized monkey statue. The pirate is lifted and dropped while the jewel is swiftly taken away by LeChuck, currently as a human. Already, do we have more monkeys showing up in the first seconds of this movie? (laughs) Than the entire game. (laughs) This is the final MacGuffin that he needs to execute his plan. A swarm of angry monkeys chase LeChuck and his crew. LeChuck tosses the jewel to his second-in-command, Murray, and orders him to guard it with his life. The pirates make it to the ship, but once they cast themselves out, they see that they are met with a Navy anti-pirate armada, captained by Elaine Marley. Mm. They battle while LeChuck and Elaine hurl insults back and forth at each other. Elaine Marley was the governor in the games and in this one she's a captain of a ship Mm -hmm. does she have a lot of agency as a character in the games or is she more just oh yeah oh okay Uh, the reason she's in the game at all is because Ron Gilbert's wife said maybe make the governor a woman Ah. I don't want to spoil it but there is an absurdly feminist plot twist in the first game for a 1990 game written by three male programmers okay okay. (laughs) because already I like the idea of her being a pirate captain well anti-pirate captain Captain. Guybrush does not have the stats that you would associate with a pirate. He's not strong. He's not particularly street smart. 
Elaine is like the media idea of a pirate, and Guybrush is this inept person who accomplishes their goals through determination alone. Gotcha. So LeChuck escapes from the battle after firing a smart cannonball, which is a cannonball that explodes and creates a thick smoke screen. We then go to the credits, where the camera travels under into the sea to reveal multiple sunken pirate ships. One of the pirate flags that fell off of LeChuck's ship is reeled in by Guy Brush Threepwood, a 23-year-old chum bait fisherman dressed in a polyester pirate costume. It's revealed that Guy Brush lives with his pet monkey Sam in a houseboat, dressed to look like a small pirate ship. <laughs> and he's just Aladdin now. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I assume there's no animal sidekick in the games. Not one who sticks with you for very long. <laughs> Not until the fourth game does he own a monkey. Gotcha. It makes sense for them to create some sort of other character for him to be with at the beginning because otherwise you're just having a solitary person and you got to have something for your main character to interact with. Yeah, again, just like Aladdin written by Rossio and Elliot, the snake is eating its own tail. <laughs> Riff raff pirate. <laughs> So Guybrush works for a bait company run by Sean Cannery. That's a real Jean Ham style <laughs> joke. Yeah. There he threatens to quit his job and pursue his dream, a daily occurrence that Cannery does not take seriously. On the docks, Guybrush begins talking to a statue that actually speaks back to him and convinces him to follow his dream. One of the many things there for him to talk to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-pirate armada continue to chase down LeChuck and his crew. Murray devises a plan to create a decoy and escape to Voodoo Island. LeChuck presents the plan like it's his own, and the crew breaks out in song. The ship sails in front of Guybrush. Feeling inspired, he follows it and sails towards the pirates in his own boat. Later at Scum Bar, LeChuck attempts to recruit new members, stating that all pirates should unite under one flag. The speech has little success. <laughs> the patrons are scared of him, except Guybrush. He wants to join immediately. To officially join, Guybrush must take LeChuck's ship to Monkey Island to find treasure. With him, he brings six Barleys from Scum Bar to assist. LeChuck is handed a Monkey Island map, and Guybrush promises to find the treasure or die trying. LeChuck and his crew are stationed in Guybrush's cramped houseboat, but it's all part of the plan. Captain Elaine Marley is now unknowingly pursuing Guybrush in LeChuck's ship. Guybrush's crew is unruly and argue amongst themselves. Elaine catches up to Guybrush and boards the ship to arrest him. I'm looking at the descriptions on these pictures as we're going through them. There's a great bit of Guybrush shouting, hey, there's no girls allowed on a pirate ship, which I hope that was intentional thing about Guybrush being dumb, but I don't know. It's just a weird thing that sticks out to me. It's also weird because in the first secret of Monkey Island, like every person in a position of power on Melee Island is a woman and just no one addresses it. There's no like chauvinist remarks. It seems like they got the idea of, you know, Guybrush being very childlike and was like, well, what would a rude little boy say? Yeah. <laughs> it's very much like Kelvin and Hobbes. Yeah. If the game deals a lot with Guybrush feeling emasculated all the time, this is him trying to put on the guise of this is how I'm going to be the big tough pirate guy. It's specifically that he never feels emasculated. Oh, okay. It does seem like this was written by someone who figured out a third of the character of Guybrush, but not like the full complete picture. It could be a theme that they were going for is the arc that the main character needs to go on is recognizing that the typical definition of masculinity as he had understood it at one point is false and bad. And like that could be a setup for that kind of a journey of, oh, this earlier version of this character assumes that pirates and manly pirates have to be this way. There's still something like that in the game, although I don't want to give it away too much. Gotcha. Guybrush fires a cannon straight up into the air in an attempt to escape, and the cannonball lands on a powder keg in one of the Navy ships and causes a chain reaction that manages to sink all the Navy ships. Now Elaine is Guybrush's prisoner. Meanwhile, at Voodoo Island, LeChuck meets the Sea Hag, which I believe is just a complete ripoff of Popeye, <laughs> to execute his secret plan using the Eye of the Monkey, which will revive all dead pirates. Now LeChuck's plan is to unite all pirates, including the undead ones. 
the sea hag pricks Lechuk's finger and adds his blood to the cauldron. But when it is time to add the eye of the monkey, Murray reaches into his pocket and pulls out one of Sam's walnuts. But they don't have bootstrap three points of blood. <laughs> Sam the monkey must have secretly switched the items at Scum Bar. This angers the spirits of the dead, and in retaliation, they turn LeChuck and his crew into zombie skeletons. LeChuck and his crew, along with the sea hag, take off to retrieve the jewel from Guybrush. That's kind of fun that now we've got this great motivation for the villain absolutely hating the hero when it seems like to the hero that event of switching the walnut and the gem was like (laughs) a weird little goof that his animal sidekick just did off to the side. (laughs) So far, I'm really liking this story. Yeah. Even though it's like completely divergent of the actual game itself, like it's still like a pretty solid plot line. I could see this as like a Sinbad era DreamWorks animated movie. Sure. (laughs) If they were planning on animating it like the concept art we're looking at is drawn, it definitely would have been a much more specific animation style. The exaggerated proportions, I don't think existed as much in 2D animation, like the big studio stuff at the time. I would love to see an entire film in Steve Purcell's art style. He did co-direct Brave and direct Toy Story that time forgot, but it's the Pixar house style. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Guybrush and the crew are close to Monkey Island a piece of information that he did not share with the crew. They are terrified because they know the island is surrounded by sea monsters. He tries to convince them that there's nothing to fear, just as a baby monster flops onto the deck. So they're off the edge of the map and here there'll be monsters, is that correct? Yes, (laughs) yes. Okay. He fights off the monster in an attempt to impress Elaine, but when the monster appears, she's angry. The crew hides as Guybrush and Elaine are stranded to fight the monster. Working together, they put the baby creature into a cannon and fire it away. The monster seems to be enjoying this, making the mother chase after her child. I love the look of these sea monsters. Yeah. There's this big, doofy, grinned sea monster that I want to see. <laughs> it reminds me of the alligator from All Dogs Go to Heaven. Oh, yeah. Let's make monkeys together. <laughs> <laughs> Guybrush, Elaine, Sam, and the crew arrive on Monkey Island and find the monkey statue from the first scene. Guybrush approaches it thinking he found the treasure, but is thwarted by a horde of angry monkeys. Sam reveals the eye of the monkey, saving Guybrush, and the other monkeys consider Sam a hero for returning the precious jewel. Guybrush continues to look for treasure, even though his crew has abandoned him. Elaine tries to convince Guybrush not to work for LeChuck, but he is not swayed. Back at the ship, Guybrush encounters a zombified LeChuck. He changes his offer, stating that if he brings him the eye of the monkey, he will be part of the crew. Guybrush returns to the island to retrieve the jewel. He removes the jewel despite Elaine trying to convince him not to, but this is the only way Guybrush can fulfill his dream of becoming a pirate. He brings the jewel back to LeChuck and they perform the ritual, with the use of Guybrush's blood against his will. That definitely feels very Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> the spell works, and suddenly multiple sunken pirate ships, crewed by the undead, rise hovering above the surface of the sea. This image <laughs> of the ships rising out of the sea definitely uh, is giving me Rise of Skywalker vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, LeChuck returned. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine and Guybrush's crew attack LeChuck, but they are no match. Guybrush comes to his senses. He asks Sam for a sword and is given a fishing rod. The monkeys attack the zombie pirates and Guybrush uses his fishing skills to snag the jewel from LeChuck with the fishing pole. Guybrush holds up the jewel, halting the battle and demands a captain's duel. A bit of a parlay. Yes. (laughs) The two sword fight, but Guybrush is no match against LeChuck. Suddenly, Elaine fires a cannon at LeChuck with the baby sea monster inside who snuck onto the ship for another joyride. LeChuck is knocked off and falls into the mama sea creature's mouth and devours him. (laughs) I love that LeChuck is getting a Captain Hook ending. (laughs) Guybrush orders the dead sea pirates to return to their watery graves. Guybrush returns the eye of the monkey and says goodbye to Sam who decides to stay with the other monkeys on Monkey Island. Guybrush and Elaine embrace at the houseboat and set off to Melee Island. As they leave, the baby sea creature sneaks aboard the boat. The end. 
So that's sequel bait to a movie that was never made. <laughs> yeah. That sequel with the sea creature on the boat is extra not made. <laughs> <laughs> what is our hot takes on this? Because honestly, it's not a bad movie. It's actually like pretty well thought out. It honestly does sound like a fun swashbuckling adventure. I'm not sure if it's quite Monkey Island. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it does sound like a fun pirate movie that easily could have had the characters' names changed and have been another not Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah. Now, is there enough crossover? Like, if they did change the name, if you watch that movie and you're just like, wait a minute, they took that from the game or would you just not think that? I don't think there's anything from the game. I think I might have read the Guybrush Elaine dynamic as being like, this is kind of like a take on Guybrush and Elaine mm-hmm. or like, oh, a zombie pirate. This is kind of like LeChuck. This plot has way less in common with the plot of Secret of Monkey Island than Curse of the Black Pearl does. Yeah. <laughs> if there were still a bunch of monkeys on an island, I would have been like, okay, so they're trying to do Monkey Island. <laughs> Other than that, there's not a lot of specifics that are really drawn from specific moments from the games. I think they were more going for the vibe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's hard to know how well they would have captured that without more actual dialogue because... So much of the sense of humor of the games does come from these dialogue choices and conversations that, again, the developers were just putting in kind of as placeholder jokes and then ended up committing to being the actual sense of humor. Given that a lot of the joke of Monkey Island is that it is a video game, and given that there are jokes pulled from Get Smart, realistically, you'd probably want to make it more like a Mel Brooks movie. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I imagine a lot of the best jokes in the game would not translate into the movie because it exists as a game and is meant to exist as a game. I imagine that it would be much harder to get that same sense of humor in a movie. We were talking a while ago about the insult sword fighting, and that's only in the game to be a game mechanic to emulate the feel of swashbuckling sword fighting in a game genre that doesn't really have like a fighting mechanic. Yeah. The most iconic piece of Monkey Island dialogue that doesn't need to be in a movie because in a movie you can just have sword fighting. Yeah. <laughs> the opening scene in Road to El Dorado where Miguel and Tulio are sword fighting, but it is all just to make a show and a spectacle so they could escape. And one of them says, you fight like my sister. The other says, I fought your sister. That's a compliment. That is pretty close to what I would want to see movie insult mm. sword fighting to look mm. like, especially because they really are just performing. Yes. Sword fighting is secondary to the flinning, as they call it. Yeah. Mm. I haven't played the game, so I can't really compare it to the game. But as an idea on its own, I feel like this would be a really fun movie. I really enjoy the character designs. Going through this concept art, there's like some really fun pictures of the crews. For LeChuck's crew, Like I want to see an entire movie about each one of these people. <laughs> the biggest flex that Steve Purcell has, the way you can tell you are looking at Steve Purcell art, There is just so many details hidden in, like, every corner. Like, you open a Sam and Max panel, and there's, like, five rats running away, having their own story. The character he designed in the Cars franchise, the monster from the end of Mater and the Ghost Light, is the most Sam and Maxy anything at Pixar look, because he just has every car part on (laughs) him. (laughs) I just want to describe this image of LeChuck's crew because, like, LeChuck himself is, like, this giant square, almost like how Kingpin is drawn in the Spider-Verse movie. Yeah. You've got somebody who's got the bowler hat with, like, dumb, dumb Dugan-looking guy. You've got somebody who's, like, this little Igor, looks like he's from Adam's family or something like that, that's just, like, little sniveling gray dude. You got somebody who's got this nasty scowling face and a full beard and also wearing a beautiful pink dress. There's just so many specific details on each one of these characters. And I want to know more about all of them. Each game in the series 
has its own distinct animation style. The first two games are closer to each other than subsequent games would be just because of the low resolution at the time. There wasn't as much freedom. <laughs> There's only so many different styles you can do in 1990s. <laughs> the second game still had more cartoony backgrounds than the first game had and some more cartoony side characters. It would have been interesting if they had gone with this art style specifically for one of the subsequent games. The goal of Curse of Monkey Island is to look like a 90s animated movie. And they combine sprites and animated cutscenes and a little bit of 3D when effects are needed to create the look that you're watching an animated movie. And it is the most gorgeous game I've ever seen. The newest one, Return to Monkey Island, does this paper craft, all of the other reindeer sort of style that really works to get really stylized expressions. And I think that's the closest we have had LeChuck look like to this design. Mm. That is one of the things I appreciate about the game series is that while they do all connect, there is some level of continuity between them, but each game does feel like its own thing. That was probably one of the challenges in doing a movie is if we want this to feel like the games, which game do we want it to feel like? Sure. So after Monkey Island, the movie seemed like a bus. The development team began coming up with new potential movie ideas. They would actually meet up once a week to pitch ideas. They would flesh out new stories and create artwork for it. According to Carson, many of these ideas could have easily made a great movie, but it just never happened. In 2001, the story department at ILM was dismantled and retitled to LFL Animation, or Lucasfilm Limited Animation. Some stayed, many left, including David Carson. He went on to work as an art director for multiple James Bond games at Electronic Arts. ILM finally released a feature film in 2011 that they could finally call their own, and it was Rango. Oh! Ironically, directed by Gore Verbinski, who directed Pirates of the Caribbean. Ah. <laughs> Gore Verbinski used to work as a composite artist. That's probably why ILM wanted him as their director, because in the behind the scenes on the Dead Man's Chest DVD, an ILM artist talks about like, no director ever gave me as specific of instructions as Gore Verbinski huh. because he worked as a composite artist. Like he knew the drop down menus in the software they were using. <laughs> wow. And that is why Davy Jones looks that good, yeah. because a composite artist has never directed a CG performance before that or after that, probably. Mm. I also think it's funny that the animation department became Lucasfilm Limited Animation, which currently has only two released feature films. You want to know what those two films are? I'm going to guess Rango and Clone Wars. Is the other Strange Magic? It's Clone Wars and Strange Magic. Uh, you yeah. each got one. I've been holding the joke for the longest time. This is the longest Strange Magic history I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2011, LucasArts confirmed the existence of the canceled Monkey Island film when they released the Monkey Island Special Edition Collection. In the collection, players would get modern remakes of the first two Monkey Island games, along with storyboards and concept art from the unmade film created by Tony Stachy and Steve Purcell, with some additional art from Garrett Sheldrew, Delia Ghostman, and David Carson. And that is the full, complete history of the movie The Curse of Monkey Island. Wow. Anybody want to see this movie? The thought has occurred to my mind that... Well, if universal travel did exist, that would be what I would do with it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm going to grab a DVD of that and bring it back. <laughs> I would probably have been disappointed that it wasn't just a more faithful adaptation of the game, but I might have enjoyed what the movie was on its own terms. Yeah. I think you brought up a good point that like, it's not really a Monkey Island movie, but... Overall, it's just a good pirate movie. It's a fun pirate movie. And it seems like the kind of thing that probably would have captured the imaginations of a bunch of kids who have no familiarity with the game, but would just like like the characters and the vibe and everything. Mm -hmm. And then see the games on Steam when they're like 20 and have disposable income and be like, wait! <laughs> yeah. And then it would have a huge fandom that I could talk to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. If they were to ever make 
a movie based off of Monkey Island. This is not going to happen, unfortunately, because the wrong studio owns the rights. But I feel like... Dave and I should write the screenplay. I agree. Exactly. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think Sony Animation is probably the best suited yes. to adapt this. Like, Especially if you're looking at the Phil Lord and Chris Miller ethos of the way Spider-Verse works. And I know this isn't Sony Pictures, but the Lego movie, both do things with the medium of animation that also ties into the medium of what they are adapting. And I think if anybody can come up with ways to adapt the meta humor of Monkey Island being video game humor, it's the teams behind Spider-Verse and Lego Movie. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely love to see Lord and Miller do a Monkey Island movie, but something tells me they're not so eager to work with Lucasfilm again anytime soon. (laughs) (laughs) I had long speculated what a live action Monkey Island movie would look like without just looking like Pirates of the Caribbean. Even though he's a little old for the role, the casting I always saw in my head for Guybrush was Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, Oh, I I can see see that. that. It's also interesting that the name they went with for this movie was Curse of Monkey Island, which was the name of the third game, the first game made without Ron Gilbert. That is the game that looks like an animated movie. And then here we would have an animated movie in a completely different style with a completely different story. Yeah, that would be weird that the game is emulating the look of a 90s 2D animated film. And then there would be a movie with the same name that was 3D. Just to close the loop on the how did this not get played side of things. So... There were multiple subsequent Monkey Island games. There was Curse of Monkey Island. Then there was Escape of Monkey Island, which was the first game in 3D. It is not fun to play. (laughs) It's really clunky controls. I do not enjoy playing that game. (laughs) They insisted that 3D games that were doing well at the time were about running and jumping. And Guybrush is more of a standing and talking guy. (laughs) And you get way too good a look at the model for way too long. (laughs) Yeah. For about a decade, that seemed to be the nail in the coffin for the Monkey Island franchise until 2009 when it was announced that not only would the special edition come out of the original Secret of Monkey Island, but also Lucasfilm was partnering with Telltale to make a new episodic Monkey Island game, Tales of Monkey Island. That came out a couple years before the Disney acquisition and Telltale's dissolution. Yes. Uh, I got the franchise in 2014, you need to understand. (laughs) And I was like, maybe they'll make another one. And then I was like, oh no, all of the companies that worked on this don't exist anymore. Yeah, because eventually Disney just shut LucasArts down altogether because... By that point, LucasArts was mostly just putting their name on games that other studios were making anyway. And at a certain point, Ron Gilbert had given up on trying to call Disney to get in touch with possibly licensing the rights from them and started tweeting at them. And that's when I was like, oh, this is never happening. (laughs) Ron Gilbert was a consultant on Tales of Monkey Island. He's credited as visiting professor of monkeyology. (laughs) As well as it's the first one that Dave Grossman wrote since the original Ron Gilbert 2. Tim Schafer has not returned to the franchise because he is amazing now. I don't know. Because he's plenty successful on his own right. Double fine, Psychonauts, look it up. (laughs) Several years ago, Ron Gilbert had that post I mentioned earlier about if he were to make his new Monkey Island game. One of the things he said in that post was that he would only make it if he owned the IP outright because he was tired of making things that other people owned. Mm. There was also a post from around that same time where he said, if I ever do get to make another Monkey Island game, I will announce it on April Fool's Day. (laughs) Yes. On April 1st, last year, 2022... Not looking at the post, but it basically said, I don't really like April Fool's jokes, but this year I'm going to do something different. I'm going to make a new Monkey Island game. And everyone was looking over that wording like... Wait, is it real? Is it not? (laughs) Is he saying that what he's doing different is making an April Fool's joke or what he's doing different is making a Monkey Island? It could go either way. Yeah, either way, he does not disappoint. Yes. (laughs) Given the original, I will announce it on April Fool's post was like over a decade old. He must have spent so long thinking about that phrasing. Yes. (laughs) And then a couple days later, a trailer dropped. In it, Murray the Skull said, Ron Gilbert told me he'd never make another Monkey Island unless... And then 
they knock him into the water before he can finish it. <laughs> what ended up happening was, you know, he did not get the IP himself, but LucasArts was willing to license the IP to Devolver Digital with evidently just enough creative freedom for Ron Gilbert to be happy working on mm. it. He got a deal where he did not have to answer to anybody because, again, Lucas and Disney didn't really know that they owned this. <laughs> so I'm sure it was just some arrangement of they found the right person to talk to to say, we will give you money if you let us make this game. And they were like, OK, sure. <laughs> I think a year or two prior, there was an announcement at E3 that some LucasArts Star Wars games would be remastered. And then after it ended, it faded to black and Monkey Island music played and then it just went on to the next presentation and everyone was like, what does this mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Eventually, Ron Gilbert made Return to Monkey Island, which is not the game he would have made if he was doing his Monkey Island 3 because it does take place after all the other games. He does not rewrite the things that came after him out of canon. Some of the ideas from his Monkey Island 3 did make it into games. It was supposed to be about Guybrush going to hell and fighting the demon pirate LeChuck, and the demon pirate LeChuck is the villain in Curse of Monkey Island, and Guybrush goes to the crossroads in Tales of Monkey Island. The extent of his idea for Monkey Island 3 did not go much deeper than that at the time like he later said on a blog post like my monkey island 3 idea was basically guybrush goes to hell and also stan shows up at some point <laughs> for decades this fan base had fought amongst itself over like but this isn't canon because this isn't what ron's monkey island 3 was going to be <laughs> ron had established that his elaine and guybrush were a hookup that later turned into a mentor mentee older sibling relationship because of that, we have had to endure decades of Ron Gilbert fans saying, they're not supposed to be married! And then Ron Gilbert writes a game and they're just still married. And I'm like, ha ha. Yep. <laughs> like Ron said in his blog post half a decade ago or whenever it was where he talked about his hypothetical Monkey Island 3, he said that it would not be the same game that it would have been back then. And now here we are several years later and it's still not the same game that it would have been at that time. But that's just because... The way he develops is finding it in development. He worked collaboratively with these other programmers. They try things out, and if they work, they keep them in the game. The fans who imagined that he had this like master plan for how the entire lore would go <laughs> were kind of making that up. <laughs> fans assuming there's so much lore is such a silly thing to me. Yeah. And when you beat the game, you unlock a note from Ron Gilbert and Dave Grossman. Right when they were starting production, they wrote this to then later release it in the game as kind of a time capsule. They basically stated that the first games are about an inept pirate claiming he can do things because we were in our 20s and making these stories for Lucasfilm. <laughs> This game is about where we are now, now in our lives. We are fathers and we have worked on dozens of games at this point. And it's a little interesting to us that the one we get interviewed the most about is this one we made in our 20s when we didn't know what we were doing. And so the whole game is kind of Guybrush living through that. We did ultimately get a third Monkey Island game from Ron Gilbert. It's its own thing, just like all of the games in this series are. And I think this movie also would have been its own thing. I probably, had I seen this, would have wanted something closer to the game, but hopefully I would have been able to enjoy it on its own terms. What baffles me the most about the development of the movie is that no one thought, hey, let's ask Ron Gilbert what he wants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> May I real quick give you a tinfoil hat that I've had no other outlet for? Yes. Okay, the Putt-Putt game franchise was created by Shelley Day based on a bedtime story she told her kid, okay? Shelley Day produced Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge. Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge 1992 
at LucasArts. The first putt-putt game, 1993, a year later at Ron Gilbert's company. So what is the likelihood that she explained this bedtime story to her kid to Ron Gilbert at the offices of LucasArts? I would say fairly high if they went and started a company and released the game within a year. Who else worked on Monkey Island 2? Steve Purcell, a writer on the film Cars. I have just placed a Cars writer present at the putt putt. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, I think this is probably going to be the end of this episode on Monkey Island. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Thank you for joining us on uh, this excursion. If you're a new listener who just was Googling Monkey Island movie and we came up, thanks for the listen. I feel like that's how we get a lot of our downloads. David Ganzel, where can people find more of your work? People can find more of my work on the internet. All of my links are at doggins.com, D-O-G-G-A-N-S.com. Links to whichever social media accounts still exist by the time this podcast is out. I also do a podcast with my wife on Patreon uh, at Home with the Dogginses, where I've talked about Monkey Island a couple times. My wife has not played the game, so those episodes are basically just me explaining things to her. <laughs> on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Doggins, I've got a couple Monkey Island videos and a couple Monkey Island live streams that feature Charlie Marlowe here. Uh-huh. Is that podcast with your wife your only podcast? Well, as of this recording, it's my only released podcast, but... I'm working on another podcast with, uh, let me check here, uh, Charlie Marlowe, <laughs> as well as Ella. We are working on a Gallivant rewatch podcast. Ooh. Is it still coming? I haven't heard any updates about this in a while. That's because we are all busy people and easily <laughs> distracted people, but... <laughs> <laughs> it is still in the works. We're off on a secret mission. A Gallivant rewatch podcast is happening someday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of other things that Charlie is working on, is there anything else you would like to plug, Charlie? I am now making an abridged series of the Zelda cartoon called Well Abridge Me Princess, which can be found at wellabridgemeprincess.tumblr.com, where I voice Lincoln Zelda and Dave voices the head of the Moblins. There's an associated Twitch with the Zelda Abridge series where I am an 80s cartoon Link VTuber. A VTuber is the webcam tracks your movement and translates it to an animated character. And so I play video games Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and that gets interpreted by the output as the well excuse me princess link playing video games and that is at twitch.tv slash well x the letter x cues me if you want to find any of those links we're going to have those in the episode description if you want to find out more about this podcast and our other podcasts you can go check out our website pipedreampodcasts.com which is also the home of come on Fugle pods pod made you special escape from fault disney and the mystery shack look back while you're there you can also find links to our social media pages. We're on Twitter at HDTNGM. We're on Instagram at How Did This Not Get Made. I say this every week that those are really, really excellent follows as a companion to this, especially this week because I want you to see all of the awesome artwork that we were looking at here. Dan does an amazing job at posting concept art or other visual pieces that go along with the episode that we are talking about. There's a lot of podcasts social media pages that are just there to like notify you when there's a new episode out how did this not get made is a good follow and it's like honestly you're missing a part of the podcast unless you're seeing some of the stuff that dan posts on those pages you can also send us your emails not get made at gmail.com with any corrections or additions or suggestions for future projects we also have a Patreon page that supports this show as well as Come On Fuhuga Pods and Pod Made You Special. At that Patreon page, we have all kinds of perks, including ad-free versions of all of our shows, access to all of Dan's notes and sources, which sometimes there's some really fun articles that <laughs> Dan shares in there that you can uh, go into some really cool stories to get some more info about what we're talking about. And we have a button club where you get a cool, awesome button mailed to you. All of those links can be found at our website, pipedreampodcasts.com. 
That's going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Thank you. Good night, everyone. And remember, never pay more than $20 for a computer game. (laughs) 